This is the tale of a religious order that grew out of greed, hatred and envy, was based upon religious intolerance and yet managed to create such a myth of propaganda around itself that it was viewed as something of the highest spiritual and moral standing, and still is to this day. Ours is not a tale that will continue that propaganda. This is a work that will investigate the order, warts and all, and reveal a startling conclusion that is simply ignored by most historians. This is a history of the sovereign military order of the Knights of Malta, like you've never heard before. Many of the problems we face in the world today can be traced back to one particular period in time. In the 11th century, the Christian world was sent into a frenzy of religious bigotry and hatred towards all those who did not believe in Jesus Christ as the saviour of mankind. Hundreds of thousands of European Christian zealots poured across Europe, killing tens of thousands of Jews and other so-called unenlightened people along their way towards the battlegrounds of the Holy Land. This religious fervour had been created and fostered by the powers of the Roman Catholic empire-building church over several decades. Gradually, the message of peace and humility at the core of the original Christian teachings was eroded, amended, and finally utterly destroyed in favour of a promise of salvation. Eternal life was offered for those who submitted themselves to the will of the Almighty Church and offered their lives in combat against the evil Muslims. All the sins of your life and those of your ancestors would be forgiven if you took the cross and marched with your brethren into the promised land. Over several decades, subtle lies and myths were created and fostered surrounding the world of Islam, and Europe swallowed it completely. The Catholic Church utilised this emotional power and the fear of hell and went on a crusade to destroy its opponent, steal land 
and grow fat and rich on the proceeds. For too long the Catholic Church had failed to grow in wealth and military might because of its creeds. Now it had all the tools it needed to turn this around. The truth is that on the whole Christians, Jews, Gnostics and all manner of other groups had lived relatively peacefully side by side with their Muslim rulers for 300 years. Islam saw them as the people of the book and Muslims were instructed to live in peace with them. The aggression came from the Christian side, spread originally by the empirical Byzantine church which was ignored initially by the Catholics but then later utilised as a great story for their own ends. The Catholics, it seemed, were finally going to come running to the aid of their Byzantine brothers against the terrible onslaught of evil Islam. The truth was that both the Byzantine Church and Islam were in the sights of Western Europe, and the war has been raging ever since. But history is never quite so simple, for it involves humans who live with divided and often dualistic minds, cultures and civilizations. Islam is not free of blame and from early on in the 11th century there is evidence that some ill treatment of Christian pilgrims occurred. One such event seems to have been a seed of much resentment. Caliph Hakim was a Fatimite who was fanatical and demented. His rule was one of overzealous religious intolerance and culminated in his persecution of the Christians and the destruction of the Church of the Resurrection in Jerusalem in 1009. This kind of act played directly into the hands of a Catholic Church which had been steadily altering doctrine towards a more radical, militaristic approach. The stage was set for war between two powerful worlds. But a response did not come quickly, and as problems continued in the Holy Land and propaganda built in the West, the big confrontation had to wait until 1096 and 1097, as the First Crusade got underway in two waves. It was in this period that the Order of St John of Jerusalem was set up under the auspices of being a religious community to care for pilgrims. They were in fact originally part of the Benedictines, whose patron saint, John the Baptist, they still revere. The very first Grand Master was Brother Gerard, who had in fact simply taken over the work of previous men and women such as Father Simon of Syracuse. The original location and acts of the Order therefore stretch back much further than the assumed date of 1099. That they had indeed cared for many Christians in those troubled lands is not doubted. Whether they were in fact building underground networks of spies and undermining the social framework whilst doing so cannot be proven. However, the turn of events thereafter sees the order building in importance and as Jerusalem fell to the Christians, their role increased and their rewards blossomed. By 1113, Pope Paschal II approved the foundation of their hospital and placed the order under the direct aegis of the Holy See, giving it virtual self-rule apart from the interference of nation states. The situation in the Holy Land quickly turned into a European feudal battleground and the order itself took on a military role due to the constitution of the King of Jerusalem and the rules of the new Grand Master, Raymond de Puy. The order, known commonly as the Knights Hospitallers, 
was now the defender of the faith as well as healer, and mirrored their brothers in the Knights Templar, with whom they had some rivalry. It was at this early stage that the Order adopted the eight-pointed cross known as the Amalfi Cross, taken from the Amalfi merchants who aided in funding the early hospice and made up of four arrows facing inwards. By the end of the 13th century, the final Christian stronghold in the Holy Land fell, and the Order retreated to Cyprus, and then in 1309 they took the island of Rhodes under the guidance of Grand Master Fawkes de Villarette. It was obvious to everybody by now that the defence of the West and the power of Christendom in the Mediterranean would rely heavily on a strong naval force, and so the Order built one. Soon, the Order became infamous for its naval prowess, fighting many battles and aiding such crusades as those in Syria and Egypt. This infamy helped not only the Christian and European cause, but also the Order itself, as more and more rich and powerful knights flocked from across the divided lands of Europe to join. In addition to this, the Hospitallers took in the remnant of the disbanded and discredited Knights Templar, along with much of their treasure, wealth and land. Provence, Auvergne, France, Italy, Aragon, England, Germany and others all brought with them land and treasure, growing steadily the might of the Order. Governed by a Grand Master, the Order minted its own money, created its own rules, and managed one of the most strategically powerful naval forces the planet has ever seen. But the pressure was still on, and their military prowess made them a target for the Muslim, suffering several attempted invasions from the Sultan of Egypt and the Ottomans. In 1522, the 400 ships and 200,000 strong force of Suleiman the Magnificent finally arrived on Rhodes, and there was a heroic six-month siege, ending in the knights being allowed to respectfully withdraw to Sicily. It was a mistake Suleiman would regret. For several years, the knights had no real home until they struck a deal with Emperor Charles V of Spain to occupy the islands of Malta and Gozo. Here, the knights grew in wealth and prestige, and in 1565, they were to shock and amaze the known world by defending the islands valiantly against a massive Turkish invasion force. Their constant actions against Barbary pirates and Muslim vessels had drawn the anger and focus of the Ottoman Empire. In addition to this, Malta itself was seen as essential for the Ottoman invasion of southern Europe. The only thing standing in the way were the Knights of Malta. 700 knights and around 8,000 soldiers held back and defeated an estimated force of 40,000 Turks. Under the guidance of Grand Master Jean Parisot de la Vallette, the Knights of Malta made a courageous stand against all odds and became the heroes of Christendom. A new capital was now built, Valletta, and the ranks swelled. Honours poured in from across Royal Europe and the Knights loved it. Pride grew, and for 200 years the Knights of Malta stood firm and sovereign over their land. They became fabulously wealthy and drew revenues from more than 140 estates in Palestine and from some 19,000 manors in Europe. The fantastic buildings of Malta and Gozo stand as a testament to the grandeur and power of the order. They brought in the highest skilled artisans to create stunning works of art and fashioned grand European buildings among some of the finest in the world. In their churches and cathedrals, they left behind beautiful marble memories of themselves with clever symbolic devices revealing many occult concepts and little in-jokes. 
always mocking of death, which they believe to have overcome. These intricately crafted and designed concepts draw the visitor to stand in awe and compete with the overpowering size of the surrounding buildings and the master's artwork above. But times were changing in the world, movements were forming, underground knowledge was being spread abroad and the old ways were falling apart. Royal houses collapsed, the power base of the Catholic Empire was being undermined and with it the power of the order itself. Towards the end of their time in Malta, the Grand Masters and the Knights became something other than the supposed chivalrous and pure Knights of the Cross they were supposed to be. A rot set in or even an enlightenment as some call it, bringing with it a new kind of renaissance One of the final Grand Masters brought with him ideas outside of the Catholic creed and discredit on the order itself. His name was Manuel Pinto de Fonseca. It is the mid-18th century, and the grand city of Valletta is the pride of Malta. Outside St John's Church, there is a throng of people awaiting word on the new Grand Master who would lead them. The clouds begin to break up, and the sun shines through. A good omen is claimed by the masses. God has spoken. The announcement is swiftly made. The new Grand Master will be Portuguese. His name is Manuel Pinto de Fonseca, known later by all as Grand Master Pinto. The people are overjoyed and live in hope that this will be an upright and honest leader. Pinto had, after all, been Vice Chancellor to Grand Master Vilhena, a much respected man and it is hoped that Pinto learned much from his time as underling, but these hopes will soon be dashed.
Pinto was the 68th Grand Master of the Order of the Holy Religion of the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, of Palestine, of Rhodes and Malta. He reigned from 1741 to 1773. Very swiftly, Pinto set to work attempting to overcome the problems he had inherited, mainly the rapidly emptying coffers of the order. He began by raising a loan and set about several building campaigns, not least of which was to be a city named after himself, but which eventually took the name of Kwame. He also attempted to begin cultivating silk by planting mulberry trees, but failed miserably. What surprised everybody though was how he pressed new coins to celebrate every single new venture, no matter how small. Nobody could figure out why, other than the assumed arrogance of Pinto himself and his desire to be remembered by posterity. Indeed, this was the pattern Pinto was to set for most of his reign, and it drew the consternation of his knights and the people of Malta ultimately to the point of revolution. In 1749, one of his bodyguards named Kassar discovered a Turkish plot led by a Muslim slave named Mustafa Pasha to overthrow Pinto. The plot was halted, the ringleaders punished and Pinto pressed more coins to celebrate. However, Mustafa was an incredibly important slave, being the Pasha of Rhodes and under French pressure and for peace with the Turks, Pinto released him. In his zeal to become something almost secular, Pinto began creating new titles for his nobles and indeed himself. He became Most Eminent Highness and called himself Prince of Malta. His prestige amongst the nobles of Europe grew and grew. He built universities, hospitals, courts of justice and improved the defences. The Knights of Malta were certainly no longer mere monks and servants of the Pope. They had ideas far in excess of their little rocky island in the Mediterranean. Pinto knew and understood the power he had in this rapidly changing world, that he was the sovereign of a very strategically placed island, that he and his men stood between the east and the west. His knights were in fact some of the world's most powerful nobles or sons of nobles collected from across Europe. But he also knew that this strength would depend upon his own clever chess playing and he played non-stop with monarchs across Europe. Pinto was political, not religious. His power was in his prestige and position, not in his humility to the church. But he knew that times had changed and with it the order itself was under threat. Europe was no longer predominantly Catholic and trouble in France would slow the massive revenue from the French knights. His own Maltese subjects were turning on him due to the revolutionary ideas spreading rapidly around the world and the falling standard of living on the islands. All men are equal was the call of the common man, and yet Pinto maintained a pompous and austere profile, lavishing luxuries on himself and his friends. His attitude drew the attention of the island's religious authorities, and so he took them head on. Pinto's opinion was that the religious leaders were fostering the antagonistic view of the people, and he decided to manipulate the situation. He could not touch the bishop, and even less the island's inquisition, without major upset and probably his own unseating. But he could fight the Catholic spy network, the Jesuits. In truth, the Knights of Malta and the Jesuits had never seen eye to eye, 
and many believed that the Jesuits had become too powerful in the order itself. But there was also the very wealthy Jesuit college, and Pinto had his eye on it. However, only the Pope himself could remove the Jesuits from Malta, and so Pinto fabricated a lie that it was in fact the King of Prussia, Frederick II, who was demanding their expulsion. Even though the Pope knew of the lie, the request was granted, and the Jesuits expelled in 1768. University, and Pinto seemingly more arrogant than ever. But what is the truth? Was Grand Master Pinto simply a man caught between two worlds? The old religious and monarchical orders and the new power of the people? Was he trying to bridge the divide on Malta? Or was he simply fighting for the survival of the order and perpetuating the memory of his own rule? The truth is that Pinto, like many knights and grandmasters before him, did not follow the rules of religious convention. They were not entirely pious. They gambled, battled, and fornicated like all men. Pinto himself had an illegitimate son named Jose Antonio Pinto de Fonseca e Vilena. The line still exists to this day. In fact, the Knights of Malta have not been entirely truthful or forthcoming in regard to their darker historical secrets, and we may find that nothing has changed. But one dark secret which caused the scandal for Pinto himself was the affair of the alchemist and the order. Ever since the medieval period, and before, great minds in Europe have known that there was more knowledge in the world than that passed on to them by the rule of the church. They knew that the fables of Christianity were employed by those in power to maintain and build that power, and so many searched out that hidden and sometimes lost knowledge, and built great libraries of occult wisdom. These men and women were not ordinary men and women. They were learned in the arts, languages, science and politics. Neither were they alone in their drive to uncover ancient secrets. Often societies and organisations grew up and around them and today we have the vestiges of these early groups in the Freemasons, Rosicrucians and others. These were powerful people, very often within the heart of government. People such as Dr John Dee in Elizabethan England held great power over those around him for his own personal knowledge and his collection of books. By the late 18th century, the Freemasons had become one of the most powerful non-state, non-religious and non-governmental bodies in the known world and it was spreading like wildfire. To curb this power, the Catholic authorities banned it outright, and yet it crept abroad unabated, 
and spread even within the Catholic fold, making a mockery of the ban, as it still does today. The very basis of Freemasonry reveals a knowledge that is not just claimed to be from before the advent of Christianity, but was in fact based upon the knowledge that created Christianity. The Knights of Malta, under the leadership of Grand Master Pinto, were not separated from this influence, an influence which was aiding in the spread of the overthrow of monarchies and religious power, and spreading the word of equality for all mankind. Whilst disseminating these new world views, Freemasonry was in fact being joined and taken over itself by the very people it supposedly sought to undermine. In truth, these new movements simply shifted the power base back to the old elite, while circumnavigating the emotional tide of the masses. One man who helped in the spread of this relatively new movement and who would scandalously come into contact with the Knights of Malta is known as Count Cagliostro and his own history is clouded in mystery and intrigue. It is claimed that Cagliostro's real name was Giuseppe Balsamo and by others that this itself is a fabrication. Evidence from 1787, however, uncovered by Goethe and closer to the period than anybody else, reveals documents placing Cagliostro's heritage within the Balsamo family. And Goethe even visited Felicita Balsamo, Cagliostro's mother, in Palermo to ascertain the truth. For himself, Cagliostro claimed to have been born of Christians of noble birth and abandoned at birth on the island of Malta. But no other evidence backs up this claim, which was in all likelihood used as a means of accessing the Knights of Malta and various other dignitaries. The claim in fact becomes more bizarre, mystical and builds his occult pedigree as he supposedly travels to Medina, Mecca and Cairo learning the sacred arts of alchemy, the Kabbalah, and magic. In truth, he appears to have been given a perfectly good education in Palermo, Sicily, nearby Malta, and to have become a novice in the Catholic order of St. John of God, from which he was soon expelled. But he did learn chemistry, and the almost magical spiritual rites that he would later adapt. Fleeing to Messina, following some dubious attempts at fraud, we next find Cagliostro on the island of Malta, and here we know the history to be true, for it is recorded by the knights themselves. Here, Cagliostro became an auxiliary of the order, using his medical and chemistry skills as a pharmacist within the hospital. The lessons he learned whilst in the order would later be put to great use in the royal courts of Europe, where this great magician and alchemist would reveal healing works of wonder. The later archivist of Grand Master Rohan would write that Pinto spent one million lira in entertaining Cagliostro, an incredible sum of money for a fraudulent dropout at any time. There had to be good reason.
some months, there had been lodging in the palace of his most serene highness, a man who claims to be a chemist. This man was received by his aforementioned highness and admitted to his full confidence, being lodged in his palace and maintained at his own expense. The reason for this is that he has announced his intention to concoct a certain elixir of life designed to keep man sound in health, both in body and mind. Why Pinto associated with the strange fraudster is not entirely known, but the truth probably lies in Pinto's own fascination with alchemy. In taking Cagliostro into the very heart of his palace, Pinto went against the rules of the order, but in his own open fascination with alchemy, even turning over rooms in his own palace for the work, simply went against the rules of the church. Pinto was openly his own man and sought out greater knowledge. Whether Cagliostro and Pinto actually managed to uncover the secret of the elixir of life is open to debate, but Grand Master Pinto was the longest lived of all Grand Masters, dying at the incredible age of 92 and being perfectly lucid until the end, fit indeed of body and mind. One symbol that always surfaces in the work of alchemists and mystics is that of the serpent, and in Malta this symbol is to be found on almost every religious building in one form or another. The official story has it that this was because St Paul supposedly survived a snake bite when he landed upon the island, and this itself is a cover story for an arcane truth, as I have shown in my previous works. What is interesting to note here in the tale of Cagliostro is the very same symbol with which he identified himself, known as the seal of Cagliostro. This unusual symbol depicts a serpent, an apple in its mouth, impaled with an arrow, and was found amongst his personal effects on his death in 1795. While the symbol has obvious alchemical elements, its precise meaning is unknown, although the great mystical writer Eliphas Levi stated that it contained the names Akarat and Arthotas, two names associated with Cagliostro, and representing the great secret and the great work of the alchemist. It is in fact the symbol of a union between the opposing forces, the universal balance which is the great work itself upon the self.
in the scandalous affair of the diamond necklace, which involved Marie Antoinette and Cardinal Rohan, but was later released due to insufficient evidence against him. Nevertheless, he was asked to leave France and arrived in England where he was forced to deny charges of being an ordinary commoner and not of noble birth at all, denying that he was Giuseppe Balsamo in an open letter to the English people. Eventually, Cagliostro visited Rome, where he was caught red-handed by spies of the Inquisition and probably betrayed by his own wife. He was sentenced to death, which was later revoked to life imprisonment, and died in the fortress of San Leo. For all his faults, Cagliostro made his mark supplying the supposed mystery of the ancients to the hungry minds of the royal courts in Europe, and all this following his time with the Grand Master of Malta going strictly against the order's own rules which state no one should dare to practice any kind of sorcery or be involved in it or imitate any form of it. Anyone found guilty of practicing any of these sorceries or commissioning such practices to others will be condemned to row in the galleys for five years. The same punishment will be meted out to those goldsmiths and silversmiths who dare receive or work on any kind of metal for alchemy without earning any exemption of the penalty on the plea of ignorance. Grand Master Pinto was in fact not just interested in the world of the occult. He actually led a secret enclave of 23 specially chosen noblemen from across Europe. These special people were in Malta for the purpose of discovering the secret of the Philosopher's Stone itself, understanding the Kabbalah and getting to grips with divination. and Ian Douglas in around 1770 shows Grand Master Pinto presiding over this circle of magic and confirming that Cagliostro was in fact receiving an education at the hands of the very formidable practitioners of the hermetic arts. Nothing happens by accident except disasters. If you are here tonight, it is because you were drawn Thesis, however, holds water when one looks at the facts. Pinto did have an alchemy lab. He did draw in close brothers from across Europe, and he did take in Cagliostro and aid in the spread of Egyptian Freemasonry.
illegitimate son of Pinta himself. The facts that we do have show strange meetings, scandalous affairs with alchemy and the occult, the spreading of illegal secret societies and underground knowledge, and the drawing close of an old power system. The question on a perfectly political front now has to be, just how and why did the Knights of Malta survive and indeed obtain permanent observer status within the world's most powerful group of countries, the United Nations? Today, entry to the original Knights of Malta is as close to the ordinary man as it ever was. Yes, there are numerous modern reinventions, all claiming to be somehow linked to the order, but they are not. The true order remains today the sovereign military order of Malta, and is a closed Roman Catholic fraternity, allowing only those of noble birth entry into their innermost ranks. The Sovereign Grand Master is recognised by nations around the world as a head of state, given religious rule with the title of Cardinal and secular power with the title of Prince, even though there is no land to rule over. Their land is one unseen. Members owe allegiance to their leader as a royal head of state, and this being above the land of their own birth. Evidence of their power is found just after the Second World War when their ability to issue passports enabled them to aid Nazis fleeing mainland Europe with false identities. Indeed, they issued their highest reward, the Grand Cross of Merit, to the Nazi general Reinhard Gellin. It is claimed by conspiracy researchers across the world that the Knights have been implicated in the construction of the CIA, and even Watergate journalist Carl Bernstein claimed that Ronald Reagan's CIA director, William Casey, was a Knight and gave secret information to Pope John Paul II. Their main aim, to reduce the power of communism. In fact, following the Second World War, Nazi, Catholic and the Western world joined forces against the rise of communism, which threatened to undermine the very power of each and every European state, and there was little evidence that it would end there. There is little wonder, therefore, that the Knights, all men of considerable power and authority, were involved in joining forces with the Office of Strategic Studies the SS and the British Secret Service and other Catholic powers to fight the power of communism. Part of this battle included recruiting and redirecting ex-Nazi war criminals as early spies and fighters against the Russian threat. The effective use of the order's passports was simply part of this secret work. From the secretive Bilderbergers to the Freemasons, from the CIA to MI5, the Knights of Malta were and can be found. The reason is simple, it is because they are men of noble birth, are taught and trained in the highest schools and universities in the world, and enter politics and positions of power unlike almost any other closed system. Because of this, their lives are scrutinised by conspiracy buffs and implicated in almost every scandalous affair on record. The question has to be asked though, is it fair and right that those born into families that are wealthy and powerful should tell the rest of the world how to live? Are we right to leave the massive international games to those few men who have their base in the Vatican? What, in fact, is their goal?
There are approximately now 11,000 knights worldwide, with many break-off groups, including the Protestant Order in Great Britain, closely associated and technically having allegiance to the Pope via the ruling monarch. This order also now has membership of the United Nations, even though it technically has no nation. Why should these people have such access to this incredible power? Did you vote for them? Islamist fundamentals have called for the destruction of the Knights' Embassy in Egypt, claiming that the Knights are continuing in their sacred pledge to destroy Islam. Do not stint in your attacks, they say. I ask Allah to have it closed down or blown up. The age of the internet and the dissemination of information has made it possible to join the dots and together with conspiracy theorists, these Islamic terrorists have worked out that certain members of the Knights Order are also implicated in the security firm Blackwater, which has been used by the USA military to protect its personnel in the various wars. Whether it is communism or Islam from the East, the capitalist and royalist systems of the Catholic West is in stark contrast to the concepts of equality under the divine or the proletariat. The battle line was drawn many centuries ago, a division of idealism, and neither side is so right that it should cause war and suffering on any scale. Man does not have the divine right to rule over another, nor does he have the power to overcome his own greed in a communist state. Both ideals are flawed, and a new third way needs to be found if we are to stop this thousand-year-old war. But alas, no matter what opinion one may have of the war between West and East, Christianity and Islam, capitalism and communism, it appears to still be raging and it appears that the warriors of Christ in the black cloak and the white cross are still fighting it. We should do well to remember the words from the start of this work. This religious fervour had been created and fostered by the powers of the Catholic empire-building church over several decades. Gradually, the message of peace and humility at the core of the original Christian teachings was eroded, amended and finally utterly destroyed in favour of a promise of salvation. Eternal life was offered for those who submitted themselves to the will of the Almighty Church and offered their lives in combat against the evil Muslims.